Hello and welcome to Frankly Speaking with Lynn Franks and Friends. I'm Lynn Franks, your host, and this episode I sat down with my friend Shelley Taylor. Shelley is an extraordinary woman, a serial entrepreneur, a creative inventor of new ideas, way, way before her time in creating social purpose businesses in all levels, and right now the creator of a new app called RefAid, which is helping refugees and humanitarian issues all around the world. Shelley and I met when her late son, Shaka, was at school with my daughter, Jessica. And Shelley will also be talking about how she had to recreate her life after his very sad death when he was 32 years old and how she has in that time literally built new ideas, new business and rebuilt herself. I know you're going to look forward to hearing this incredible, moving and inspirational conversation. Welcome, Shelley. And I want to start, because I've known you so long, I want to start with your beginning because you have truly had an amazing, extraordinary life and story. Uh, you know, you've had your ups, you've had your downs, um, um, but it can, you continue on with so much energy, whatever it is you're doing. And in terms of careers, since I've known you, you've had quite a few, quite a few, <laughs> which go from being a nomad chef, doing incredible dinner parties, all the way through to doing cutting edge technology to help millions. So let's start from the beginning because your, your childhood and your background was very interesting because your parents, so tell me about your parents because they were so different and diverse and that, that diversity is in you, of course. So let's start at the beginning. So my dad uh, was black American and his parents were musicians and his mother actually is known for having created seattle jazz she's that whole um kind of music that's associated with seattle jazz even though she wasn't recorded i remember quincy jones who kind of grew up in their house telling me about her style of piano which was um I can't really describe it because, of course, I don't know enough about the piano. When would that have been? About the 30s? That would 40s? have been uh, the 20s and 30s. Yeah. I mean, blues, jazz, or the beginning of. So Amazing. it was, yeah, it was definitely jazz. And, and um, that was a period of time when the musicians, Black musicians throughout the South, were not allowed to stay in hotels. So they had like an underground railroad where they'd stay at different people's houses. And in Seattle, although it was a little bit more liberal at the time people would come through and stay at their house and they had a little um basement where there was a piano bar and that actually i kind of remembered after i started doing my nomad chef restaurant uh at my home that i actually grew up or i was born into a house that had an underground kind of illegal speakeasy bar in it so that was my my grandmother my father was a musician and he was the one who taught quincy jones how to play music um, because Quincy was in their house all the time because his mom was not really in great shape. And so he had all that great music background, but he gave it all up when he met my mom, I think probably in high school, at a high school dance of some kind where he was performing. My mom, who's white, actually German, Jewish, um, with a little bit of Mexican in there, um, they met. And that was an interracial marriage, which at the time was still pretty unusual in Seattle, a little bit more common there than maybe other parts of the country. They got married and my mom went to university, to college, and my dad traded his saxophone to go to college as he thought that would be a much better um, use of his time. So he became an anthropologist and she became a um, therapist. So that's kind of my parents. That was like way back in the, I guess they got married in the 50s, so I was born back then. And um, they were divorced when I was three, but I had very hippie parents. I actually lived in a commune for a few years with my mom, uh, my sister, and a bunch of hippie types where they were dropping acid, you know, all the time. And uh, then I moved into my own commune, no, not my own, but with other people, not my family, when I was about 14 years old. So that's kind of, that's kind of where I came from. And that was Palo Alto. So Palo Alto is where Stanford University is. And of course, there was all kinds of crazy stuff going on when I was growing up with the, the Vietnam War. I was really active in um, demonstrations. I remember getting tear gassed and run over by horses. Like, 
Mm -hmm. when I was probably about 14 years old. Oh my and God. Uh, there was all this wife swapping and husband swapping and all the taking drugs and everything going on all around me, plus the war. I became a baby Black Panther when I was, I guess, about 12 or 13 years old. I did not know that about you. How <laughs> amazing. Oh, well, it was my white mother who would drive me to San Francisco from Palo Alto and I'd make her <laughs> park two blocks away so that none of the Black people at the Black Panthers would see me go in to my little, my little youth Black Panther meeting. So that That's was uh, it was such an interesting period of time. It was a most interesting period to be in Northern California, to be around South San Francisco extraordinary time and the time of the beats and the, yeah, everything yeah. going on and grateful dead and hate ashbury i mean everything uh, that the was music happening. was amazing the music mm. was amazing wow. oh, i envy you on that one and then you got accepted by stanford at a ridiculously young age you were well, super bright i actually got accepted to mills college which was a private women's college like the equivalent of a radcliffe or east coast school at 16 i was the youngest person to go to college university yeah and um then the next year i went to stanford as well um so yeah i was, I was uh, overachieving excited. so you were at two colleges yeah. at the same time at 16 and 17 years old yeah yeah unbelievable well no was, knowing you it's not unbelievable it's totally believable well i think the thing that was more unbelievable is that i got pregnant when i was 18 yeah. and so i was what my second or third year at university and I brought my little baby to school when I was 19, and I was the first person they ever let bring a kid to class. So he actually went to class with me for two years, sat in classes, and I would just breastfeed him there. And so he liked to say that he went to university twice, once with me and once when he was on his own. Mm. The wonderful Shaka, who we're going to be talking about a little bit later, who we met through Shaka's friendship with my daughter, Jessica, when they were at school together in London, when they were about 14 and yeah, stayed best yeah, friends. Until, that's when it was. Huh? Until Shaka sadly passed. But we're going to talk about that a little bit later. So there you were, single mom, because you weren't really with the dad very no, much. No, no, I was you. definitely a single mom. Um, and at university, at two of the smartest universities in the world, both at the same time, age 19, with this baby at your breast. <laughs> <laughs> And then what? What happened? And then what? Well, then my mom got sick. I think she, I actually got pregnant when I learned that she was um, dying of cancer. I, I think that's exactly the moment that I, I got pregnant. So knowing that she had a grandson on the way kept her going, but she died when I was 21. So I had kind of that was the beginning of losing my family, I think. So let's see. So I needed to support myself and my baby. I was always into business and I started my business career at about five or six selling cherry plums and walnuts in the neighborhood and carried on. I went to this very liberal arts college, but I was very much into wanting to make as much money as I could because I had these kind of hippie parents. My dad was very hippie, anti-money. My mom was not so hippie, but she was still, you know, a therapist. Did you think it's always generations against generations? Because your parents were hippies. I remember seeing in a comic years ago, mad comic, where parents are hippie, the children become book, uh, accountants or bank managers, or in your case, you became a businesswoman. And, and I don't then, know if it's always your kids didn't swing so much. The well, other my direction. son became very Jewish, and I brought him up a Buddhist. <laughs> Let's not forget that. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> But they didn't go like hardcore into business. But I guess you were. And then they. Yeah, they were they as went, a response they, to me yeah. being. I don't know. I business. think they, they went the other way. I think Not I now. Was, uh, Jessica's, Jessica's now such a businesswoman. Anyway, you know, we're talking about my kids. Well, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's a swing or if it's not a swing, but I, I do don't know, know they that come I, back was, eventually. I was very um, concerned about making enough money so that my kid could have all of the advantages that I pretty much grew up with my single mom somehow managed to put us in good schools and tennis lessons and travel and everything. So I wanted him to have that. So that meant I had to pick a career that was very money oriented. My first job was um, as a oh, commercial real estate sale. So I was selling big apartment buildings. I took my nanny at 21, if you can believe it, across country to Washington, DC. So I had a big house on Capitol Hill with a nanny at 21. Oh, and I proceeded to uh, make as much money as I could selling real estate. And then I came back to California after my mom died 
and uh, became a stockbroker. So I was a stockbroker and a fund manager for a few years. So that's one of my many, many careers. Many hats. I forgot yeah. about the stockbroker. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That was back in the, well, that's back in the 80s. So I was into kind of creating the first socially responsible investment. Um, so was social of, responsibility always part of, well, apart from selling expensive property in Washington Heights, but generally social responsibility was always part of whatever you were doing. It seems to me it, it was. It was kind of an odd thing. It wasn't something that I would have articulated at the time, but I do uh -huh. know I got bored with being a stockbroker. I wanted to make money, but it was not a very exciting thing to do. So I kind of naturally gravitated into this social responsibility, finding the right kind of stocks with the right kind of values when it was not a thing, probably because I'm more curious about research and kind of new frontiers than I am about, you know, just sticking with the same thing. So I kind of reinvent myself every couple of years with some new, you totally do. new direction. Yeah. Yeah. So from, so from stockbroking, where did you move to? So you went to the social responsible investment. And, and did then, you actually graduate then to, well, tell me, yes, you tell me what world you were in there. So I did that for about seven years. I was hired uh, to run a venture capital company in Boston, which didn't work out. Um, so I met a guy in London and that's kind of about the time I met you, I'd say. I moved to London because I was in between jobs and I was traveling through Europe and I came back through London and I thought, you know, this might be kind of a fun place to be. My son, Shaka, was being homeschooled at the time. At the time, So he was pretty free. So we just decided to pack up and move to London. And in London, career-wise, I um, started advising, uh, let's see, the big fund management companies. And I launched three of the first um, socially responsible funds in the UK in like the early 90s. So I carried on with that whole thing. And that led to my next career, which was to do with um, publishing research studies. So I yes. been really interested in like what it is that investors thought about it way before it was a thing to invest in social responsible companies but i started thinking about what were the criteria that they used to evaluate the risk in companies for example environmental risk and and all these other things that they wouldn't have put in terms of values but there was actually financial implications if they were to have a big oil spill so i thought let me look at what companies do in terms of their practices related to their customers and the government and their employees and, and how long that. ago was that this was in 1990, 91. And that now has become the most important thing for any large corporate in terms of how they are viewed because of the, high, the importance of it to their investors and their and shareholders. And to their other stakeholders, yeah. So it was definitely not a thing at the time. And no, it, it, it needed a bunch of language um, in order to, you know, to even have a practice, you need to kind of create the language first. And so... I kind of created all that language about multi-stakeholder model of doing business and corporate social responsibility and all that Indeed. back then. And strangely, I published the study called The Rewards of Virtue. And in that study, there was a little bit of research on annual reports and what do companies say in their annual reports. And it had a lovely little matrix as I love like categorizing information. And I'm going around selling this study and people kept looking at that little table and saying, oh, I love the way you've analyzed these annual reports. And so, so bizarrely, I became kind of the world's expert in annual reports, which is such a boring sounding thing, but it was all about what it is that people say in them and quantifying all that verbiage into some kind of measurement of, you know, how socially responsible they are, how much do they talk about their strategy, blah, blah, blah. So that was another complete change in direction for my company. And this is all when you were based in London. Wasn't in London, it? I yeah. remember I you in, doing it. It was so. I important. was there for maybe. I think I was in London twenty-five or thirty years. So long. Were you really? Yeah, I got there in eighty-nine. So, oh, I and I just left five years ago when Brexit happened. So, I mean, I think of myself as a Londoner by, by adoption, until the UK went xenophobic. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm out of there. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's kind of. That was a strange kind of journey from 
going from corporate responsibility into corporate governance and disclosure and transparency. And then from that, I went back to my son um, finished high school and I went back to California with him. And I was sitting there in downtown Palo Alto, the center of Silicon Valley in the mid nineties. And guess what? The first websites started yeah. coming out. Of and most, most people don't even realize it, but the first thing you could see on a website was a PDF of an annual report. So there you go. I'm suddenly the world's expert on websites because I did all these years of studies on what annual reports say, and that's what they're using to create the content of. That's right. I websites. remember your office in downtown Palo Alto. I remember yeah, it. Exactly. That was uh, above and you had all the street. access of all those great, great, bright young people at Stanford you used to work with. And I had all MBAs. those companies, all those Silicon Valley companies. Yeah. And it was kind of the You were you were a Silicon Valley company before there were Silicon Valley companies. Yeah, in fact, they didn't really refer to it as Silicon Valley back in those days. It was mm. Palo Alto. It was all Palo Alto and you had Apple them all there embryonically. Apple, HP, all those companies were there at the time. Way I mean, the thing Facebook. is, Shelley, in truth, you come up with these things. It's a little bit like me, but I come up with different things before their time. And you do them and you do them very well. And then you, I think you get bored and you go on to another huge project where all those who are coming up behind you now with their Catching Silicon up. Valley thing going on and become these enormous companies, but you were just so ahead and so smarter. That's what happens to visionaries, unfortunately. And I think it's, it is definitely a little bit around boredom. It's something I about, think it is. it's something about like, I get excited about learning something new. I mean, right now what I'm doing is uh, completely unrelated to anything I've ever done before. And I love it because I get to just learn all kinds of stuff. And these guys in tech, you know, I, I go to these conferences and um, their eyes just kind of go past me as if I'm not there, right? Because I'm this older woman and I'll eventually get somebody to like shake my hand and I'll kind of push their head to face me and I'll say, what do you do? And they're of course happy to talk about themselves, but then I will make them listen to what it is that I do and I'll watch their heads start jerking back around to, yeah. oh, you mean you do know what you're talking about yeah. in tech, right? But they're like, you're old enough to be my mother. How do you know about apps? Yeah. And it's really just about applying my interest in things well, you, and learning. Let's talk huh? about apps because you were creating that app, the music entertainment ah, yes. industry information app. You, you weren't in Palo Alto, you'd come back to England at that point. Yeah. And you were in Notting Hill Gate in the first sort of cool co-op working space down at the bottom of um, Labrick Grove yeah. and Portobello Road. And you were working there on a concept, which again was like so way ahead of its time. Do you want to talk about that? Because in a so way it's connected was, a bit with what you're doing now, but not it, really. It is but, directly connected. It yeah, was another the same weird path. connection, exactly. app, connectivity. Um, so that was based on research that I'd done about websites for music and musicians. And I said, oh, you know what? I think that musicians need a way to generate money online. This was the time of Facebook kind of, and uh, MySpace especially, taking advantage of musicians and not paying them for anything, right? Those first sites like MySpace and Spotify, they just stole the music and paid nobody. So I guess I didn't think of it as a mission per se, again, at the time, but it was an accidental mission, which is, what if I could think of a way that I could put all these musicians' music online and give them a share of advertising revenue so they made money the opposite of what MySpace was doing? So that was all dig down. That was really exciting. That was in, what was, when was that? That was in 2006 to 2009 or 10. It was a pretty exciting time. And yeah, a lot of this stuff that we came up back then Facebook is only now doing in the last couple of years. So it was way ahead of like, we had, we had video chat rooms where you could listen to music yeah. and you could talk to people while you're watching ballet or listening to music or we had all kinds of great stuff, but it still hasn't come around. I mean, no, still there, there was, God, it was amazing. When I think of all the stuff you've done, I mean, at one point you were, I think that's when you were still in Palo Alto, you were doing these reports on what was coming next to these big companies. I can't, I don't know if you Yeah, mentioned. yeah. I did a bunch of studies on. A bunch of studies about what was coming next. And, you know, and you did sell them very well. These people would pay you so many thousand dollars to get each of the reports. 
But did they actually realise just how spot on you were? Or were they paying lip service? Because you were so spot on. You were so well, absolutely ahead of your One of my, um, I think the biggest um, things that I look back on in terms of influence that I had was that there was this Adrian Cadbury who bought my study, The Rewards of Virtue. And that became his Bible for how a company should be run in terms of this multi-stakeholder and corporate social responsibility approach. The Cadbury's. Yeah, and that he went around the world kind of making his companies follow this. And that then became kind of adopted by the RSA and the whole good company initiative came out of it. So I have to say, not everybody listened to what I had to say, but no, it's the same. Sure I mean, did. it's the same yeah. with me. I mean, I say things at the time, like you, you know, on a different level. And then years later, people say, oh, well, I heard you say that about social responsibility and being good companies. And of course, we're just catching on to it now, but it's ironic because we were ahead of our times. And Cadbury's, of course, ended up selling and selling. And now I think they're part of Kellogg's be, or something, aren't they? And yeah, and it becomes kind of part of the whole collective consciousness Corporate. because there's no way to like completely take responsibility. We come up with ideas, you know, and they just kind of melt into the ethos and become a yeah, thing of the big companies. But I, I just feel that we can't let go of this whole belief in business for good it has to i mean it has to happen but if we look at the companies that were representative at the time ben and jerry body shop and, and even unilever to a degree i mean they all you know they all sort of sold on and then sold on to another one and then sold on especially these or big companies from california out. who were started by hippies Right. And then kind of uh, what were you said, sorry, I talked to They either you. sold off or sold out. Sold I off mean, or sold on or sold out. Yeah. And then the people they sell to, and I know this from relationships with all these guys, they would talk to the people buying them and who would promise to keep the companies with the same values. And that lasted for about two seconds. And uh, L'Oreal, who at the time bought Body Shop, they don't own it now. And uh, Unilever, who bought uh, Ben & Jerry and all the rest of them. Yeah, we're going to be good guys. But it doesn't work necessarily that way for the big companies. No, and I think one of the things that's kind of, I mean, disappointing, but the older you get, the more you realize everything's just in cycles. I go to these conferences sometimes. I'm, I'm sick of them now, but to the conferences on social responsibility, and the young people will stand up and they'll say, oh no, it's completely different now. And I'll say, that's what we said, like, okay, the eighties, the nineties came around and everybody's like, it's totally different now. It's a real thing. And I'm like, nope. Then 2000 would come around. And I said, literally, I've been doing this for 40 years. And every yeah. 10 years, the generation says, oh, now we're really doing it. I'm not hundred percent sure that we're in a period of real sincere corporate social responsibility, or if it's just become established that you have to talk it's about it. It's greenwashing. It'll always yeah. be greenwashing. There's no question about it. That's why they've got PR companies <laughs> <laughs> working, working for them to show them how they can be seen as good companies to keep their stakeholders happy. Um, so yes, they've got so many people of color working there. They've got so many women, da, 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 da. but the reality is they are based on profits and, um, you know, that doesn't always work with, it and can do. I mean, I think they're too nervous. And if you look at the boards of directors that make these decisions, they're mostly made up still of middle-aged, men. middle-class white men in suits. And, you know, they don't have the vision to take the risk, I guess. They don't have the experience because you can't get it from that particular path only. You have to no. have that other diverse. But, and so what do you think then about somebody like Musk, about Elon Musk? Because he's such a, hmm. He's a big know. brain. He's, he's a big a brain. <laughs> That's one thing. He's got a lot of courage in his own way, but then he's got a lot of money to, to have that and courage. I'm, I'm a bit scared of him, to be honest. I feel like too much money in the hands of somebody who's such a libertarian is a dangerous thing. Mm. I'm not sure. I mean, you have like um, people like Bill Gates, who has mm. a lot of money. Yeah. They've definitely taken different paths around how they think money should be used responsibly. I'm sure that Bill Gates has his downside, but basically he's not. A he's he's bad hated person. by um, any anti vaxxers here in the UK, that's for sure. But, you know, he's got, he, I mean, I don't, I, I think don't it's get a more benevolent. In but, um, it's been a more, I mean, I think there are some companies and some people who've made a lot of money who are doing less bad. I feel like Elon Musk is not one of them. I think he's probably capable of. If he sticks to space and to engineering, he's probably great. But taking over Twitter um, and the values that he has, I'm kind of scared of the impact they're going to yeah. have on society. 
But I'm also scared of Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg and the metaverse. And I'm terrified, also, terrified. And I'm scared of like... Bezos and Amazon. And, yes. You know, these, these few billionaires, trillionaires, you know, with so much power and so much money. is No it, checks on their power. And no, uh, they don't pay taxes where they should. No. So. And I mean, I don't have any problem saying that I do think that um, Zuckerberg, not just Facebook, but him, because everything trickles down from the top. It's definitely responsible for a lot of genocide in the world, you know, having the algorithm that uh, responds well to hate, that generates yeah. more money from hate. I, I think we have a lot of things like that to fight against, which actually is one of my big missions, you know, with one of my apps is to create information that comes from vetted sources of organizations who care about people so that the sources of information are not um, generating revenue for um, bad behavior. So I think it's really important to fight against those things. So let's talk about, of course, the huge change that came in your life. While you were doing all these amazing things, and at that time you were working on this totally amazing. visionary concept of an app for entertainment and for musicians to get paid and for it included restaurants and cooking and food, which has always been a big love of yours. And then the horrible time that you went through when the wonderful Shaka, your son and beautiful Shaka, um, died in a horrible situation and it was a shock for everybody that loved him which were many many people for you as his mother it was horrible I can't even imagine losing a child and I, I know your, what pain you went through but that then changed your life considerably didn't it it, it sent you on an, another journey I guess uh, so the first part of that journey had to do with me first of all I was a a mom at 19. So he died at 32. I'd only ever been a mom. I'd never even had a year of being an adult. Um, so I had kind of literally the biggest identity crisis I could have, because I didn't have a sense of self that was separated from my son. And we kind of grew up together and moved countries. And even he worked with me for the last couple of years of his life at, at, our, at the music entertainment company. So I was kind of lost at sea and didn't really see ever finding a way to live. I read a book in that first year, which talked about research on 80 mothers who lost their only child or all of their children, which is pretty much the same thing. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, the research said that only 50% of mothers regained a will to live, and it came at the seven-year mark. And I remember feeling like, God, that's such a long time to wait. But I kind of committed that I would be one of those women who regained my will to live because I did not have it. It was basically a battle for the first three years of um, how to stay alive each day. Um, I don't have a sense of God or religion and there wasn't some outside thing I could hang my beliefs or courage on so it was like for me a kind of how do what do I do to get up every day and um, so my first year I kept working I kept running the company that Shaka worked at with me and the banking crisis happened in 2009 and so I ran out of the company ran out of money. We'd raised 10 million. I raised I'm the first black woman to ever raise $10 million in, in the, probably in the world. And uh, yeah. I um, kept going for a year, but then we needed to raise another 50 million to compete with Spotify's and iTunes. And I couldn't. Um, so I had to wind down the company, which was, you know, kind of like a second loss, mm. obviously not as big a loss, but it, it took away my daily thing that kept me going, which was my employees and investors and everything. So there I had this like, you know, like all this empty space that I had to fill with something. I couldn't really leave the house. Um, it's hard to describe how paralyzing it is to lose your only child in identity. Couldn't really leave the house. So I started a writer's group, which um, I taught people screenwriting. People came to my house, a half a dozen people. And it gave me people to see once a week. I started my um, my Nomad Chef secret restaurant um, because I literally lost everything. When I lost my company, I didn't have a penny. And 
a friend suggested that since I love doing dinner parties, I should try one of these secret restaurants. Two weeks later, I had the first one. Thank God I did them probably every two weeks or every week. At I first. remember I had a birthday. One of my birthday parties was one of your secret you did? <laughs> no my dinners. It was brilliant. The food was amazing. And the and conservatory and I could serve like 25, 35 people. Yeah. And I actually made enough money to kind of pay the bills. But more importantly, there was leftover food. That was really good. I got to <laughs> combine with the writing group once a week and the secret restaurant. I got to see people, but I didn't have to talk to them because I was not really capable of talking. I was not capable of responding to questions, I could just like hide and I was okay. Um, but this writing group, um, I said, let's give ourselves a carrot. If we all write a screenplay, as soon as we finish one, we'll go to Hollywood and we'll try to sell our script. So I read it at Giant House in Beverly Hills. The whole of us went um, out there. I had a lot of dinner parties. Um, I don't think anybody sold their scripts, but we had so much fun, you know, it gave us something to work towards so the combination of that and my um, restaurant kind of got me started. My cooking got me started back in the world again. And when I decided to take this group to LA, I thought, oh, I will, um, I'll make a documentary about this journey. I'll try to like, as if I could predict that I would feel like living again. I said, I'll make a film about what it's like to um, come to the point where you want to live again, right? Like, what's that journey like? Well, it was kind of faking it, but faking it until I made it. So I, I did a film in his footsteps and I went to all the places that Shaka used to live, all the places that we lived. And I did dinner parties and it took me probably a year to make this documentary. In the film, I knew that it was for other people like me who had lost everything. That's who I thought it was for, um, to prove them that you can keep living. So at the three-year point, I'd finished this film, which it got into a bunch of film festivals. And what it did was regenerate my will to work again, because I was sure I was never going to be able to work again, because my only reason to get up in the morning was because I was a mom. And I'm like, how am I ever going to want to work if I don't even have my son to care about anymore or who cares about me? But this whole thing about producing a film is very much like running a business. Being a producer, you probably know that is the same as running a business. So by the end of this three years, I had a documentary that I had produced and I was ready to go back to work, which I thought I would never be able to do. I'm not a filmmaker. <laughs> I'm not a filmmaker now, but it did kind of leapfrog me into the next business. We should show that film. You know, I have a little, well, you don't know, but one of the things I have here at the Seed Hub where I've ended up in Somerset is we have a little cinema um, club thing. And every month we show a, a movie of some kind. So I would love what we talked about you earlier today, you visiting, but we could show the doc, we could show you yeah, the story, we could show the that. film. I'd love to see it because I've never seen it. I would that would be Yeah, you know. that would be great. I mean, I I would have publicly released it, except that I'm in business. And I don't really want investors and people who I do work with to think of me as the mom who lost her kid. It's kind of a gut punch to a lot of people to even hear that. So I just kind of share it with people, um, people who are having a hard time, people who I think other moms, but more than anything, it seems like young people want to watch it because it's like um, contextualizes pain and suffering and overcoming, I guess, you know, so I think it's a huge vehicle for healing for others. And, um, you know, there will be more platforms and there are getting to be more platforms where people really want to have an example of something that's going to hit well not an example but some uh, an input from something that's going to heal them so. and how do you get how do you get through hard things my answer is you just do your way through them it's not really about thinking and feeling it's just like getting up in the morning and whatever so it's you taking really every like day by day really chop wood carry water right just yeah doing the doing so that's what got me into this new thing, which I think you were going to ask about. Yes. So I, I read that book that said at the seven year mark, the 50% of mothers regain the will to live. And I was at Ronnie Scott's on the seven year death day anniversary uh, with some of my son's friends. And I just had this kind of a, a thought that hit me, which is I had been seeing the news of all the migrants coming from Syria. I had seen the baby on the beach, dead little island on the beach. Yeah, and I, I just had this wave of, 
oh my God, I have this music app business, which I'd started, you know, another company, which people really weren't using so much, this digital fan club. was that actually? So that would have been so seven years ago. Okay. No, six, six years ago, I started the app. Okay. So, um, yeah, I had the technology, but people didn't really feel like they needed to have their own digital fan club. So I'm like, I saw these refugees. I had this thought at the seven year mark, which I will not forget because, you know, seven years it takes to regenerate all of your cells. Yeah. Seven years, they said it would be before I would feel the will to live again. And I got on the phone the next day. I got on Facebook and I tried to find people who I could talk to about refugees because I really didn't know anything myself. And I had met a woman who came to my dinner who was from Libya and I found her on Facebook and I said, can I ask you what it's like to be a refugee? And, you know, do you think they'd like to have an app like this? And she said, oh, my boss would love to hear about that. He works with the Red Cross and I had no idea. And it was like just the seven year magic that happened was that I then over the weekend created this app called RefAid for refugees. Um, where they could find, as you said uh, earlier. Ref Aid, okay. Ref yeah. Aid. My company's called Trellis, but yeah. yeah. Trellis didn't come until later. I just started with the app and then it kind of led to the other thing. Yeah. And it grew virally because people needed help. But yeah. more importantly, the nonprofit sector needed help organizing itself because everything is done on paper, you know? Like, yeah. where's the services? Oh, we've got a whiteboard or we've got a wall with services taped to it. So I kind of helped them create a database where all these services would live and they'd all push into the app and then people could find what help they needed. And it's in 41 countries now. Wow. So that was accidental. Um, there was no business model, didn't make any money from it, but it just kept growing. And then about three years ago, I kind of realized that it was a bigger problem than just migrants and refugees. It was the entire sector of government and nonprofits that needed digitalization and I kind of like to say, if you can imagine Amazon trying to deliver books, but not having any live inventory management, it wouldn't work. But the way that NGOs are, they have their product, which is services, you know, like food yeah. banks or whatever. And they're doing all that without any live inventory management. They couldn't tell you what services they had where. So this was kind of became my mission to help them be better at giving help to people who needed help. And so RefAid led to that which led to just a few weeks ago, me deciding that it was even bigger problem than just listing services, that the entire humanitarian sector needed help with logistics and supply chain to try to get the goods, like all the stuff we're seeing that needs to go to Ukraine. It's really slow and cumbersome to get medical supplies from one place to another because the organizations in Ukraine used to be in education, but now they're helping refugees and they don't know how to do a deal with the United Nations in order to get things from here to there. So you need to apply like Amazon type logistics to another sector, right? So I just created this whole new software platform, not exactly from scratch because it's built on my existing platform. I just created that in the last few weeks. And again, that's something I knew nothing about, supply you're chain amazing. logistics. That's trucks, that's trucks and trains and planes moving big stuff, right? So when I was just in um, at the Ukraine border, I was just visiting, how does this, how does it all work? And I went to see an airport there and I'm like, well, how does it work? Like, how does this stuff? So you've just like, been into Ukraine, checking it out in person. I just went to the border of Ukraine and Poland. I didn't go across because there was huge queues to get no, in no, and out. Nice. Plus, plus there's a bit of a war going. So I, um, the airport I went to is right at the border. And yeah. he said, yeah, people are sending stuff from like Pittsburgh on private planes to land at our airport and they're dumping it off with no destination in mind, haven't cleared customs. Like it's a total mess. mess. It's amazing that anybody's getting any help because it's yeah. chaotic. So I'm like, okay, let me put some order into this like I did with the annual reports. Let me just take this sector, yeah. try to create some kind of system to manage it. And that's my latest thing. It's amazing. And if the world ever needed it more than it's, now, it's for, I don't... It's, it's disasters, it's fires. Our software is being used for um, emergency management in San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, yes, I saw help. something on your website about that. So with all these fires, it's used, being used Same there. Thing. Yeah, it's the same as disaster in a war. You need to get stuff from one place to another. You need to 
um, have some way of communicating between these large organizations so that they can have a single point of visibility across all of the borders of what's, you know, what's going on here and there. So, yeah. That but you have to have quite a back room or uh, a group of people working for you on this. How does the whole thing work and how do you pay well, for them? So we have some customers. We don't make a lot of money yet. I think we will over the next couple, two, three years, make a ton of money. But the thing that's important about software is if it's well-designed, it doesn't require a lot of people. That's what software is good for, is replacing yeah. all the people that are running around using paper and pen to make lists of things. Like uh, me here. So, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, me too. I use my little pad for everything. But um, so now we don't have a very big team at all. I won't tell you how many we have because people would be shocked at how much we do with so few people, but we have this enterprise grade software platform that's being used all over the world and Incredible. it really works. And it's just because it's so well designed that it works and um, we don't need a lot of people for it. Incredible. And, and so, as you said at the start of this talk, 41 countries that you're now in helping with the logistics of people finding the humanitarian resources that they need to survive which otherwise is in total chaos it's extraordinary and how do you see that i mean what is is there a vision to take that further does it grow more um, I'd like the way to technology see, I'd like is changing to see, well technology um doesn't change that quickly actually and uh, we're in 41 countries helping migrants displaced people i would like to be in all countries helping um, more than that particular group of people, but helping people like me and you. My son's dad had a stroke a few years ago, and I have another app, which is called LifeSpot. And it does the same thing as RefAid, but for anyone. Oops. So if you had a stroke, you would immediately find out the right place to go to for help? Yes. And in fact, what I realized is that I opened my own app when I was out there in California, because his family didn't know anything about disability transport. And I'm like, well, they have these services that you just, and I said, let me look in my app. And there was like, oh yeah, we have vans for people who are in wheelchairs to take them to the doctor's appointments. And so I think my goal is that I'll map all of the social services available everywhere in the world so we can all find the help we need when we need it. So um, it really needs to get the word out there, doesn't it? Yeah. You really need to get the word out there because this is phenomenal and it's about people knowing it's there and accessible and finding out how to use it. So if people wanted to know more, would they go to your website or how would they find yeah, out? Yeah, there's, con there's contact uh, forms on the trellis.com website and on the refaid.com website. Uh, so if it's related to... And they can find out how to down download an the app apps. in their yeah. area. Exactly. And if they're like nonprofits or they work with nonprofits or government, for example, we kind of see ourselves as enablers. So my focus is helping the service providers do a better job of providing services. While we do have these apps for the public, my goal is to kind of help the sector itself get better at doing what it's doing. So, yeah. I mean, for example, if I can just bring up, I know we're running out of time, but I, I like hundreds of thousands of other British people put our names down saying we'd take Ukrainian refugees and um, I haven't really heard anything since because they can't get the visas. So they can't that, get in. Yeah, They can't get in to come and be here. I know a few people that have managed to get hold of people personally somehow, but they can't. So is that something that your app could help if people wanted to get somewhere in England or the visa thing is such a bureaucratic nightmare that's specific to the UK. So it's so. more likely in the UK that what would happen is anybody who is a, who got there could find the services they need once they were there. A lot yeah. of the people come in illegally, migrants from countries, not just Ukraine. Ukrainians sure. have been offered help in a way that no other group has I ever know, been offered I know, because I'm very help. close with Syrian refugees and Afghans and, and, right. and women, and they need help so badly. So I will say that um, in the rest of Europe, going to Poland was amazing to see. I mean, that's where Auschwitz is, right? Yeah. Going to Poland and Same quite a few your others. Family. Yes, quite a few others. And um, it was amazing to see the population of Poland has gone up by more than 10%. 
the cities have opened their arms and the way they're handling uh, opening their arms to refugees is amazing. It's kind of a role model for how I think we should all be whenever there's a war crisis, even yeah. of brown people or especially of brown and Asian people. Yeah. But it is pretty powerful. So um, I I'm hoping that that's going to give us some more compassion that you know, the Ukrainians themselves will understand, like those of us who have some Jewish or a lot of Jewish in us understand, you know, like this could happen to anyone, right? It's not yeah. just something that happens to people in Africa. This is something that could happen to anybody at any time. Yeah, well, there's even Russian threats for the UK right now that are in the paper <laughs> yeah. today, not too good. Exactly. So, well, I'm, you know, I, I could keep going for hours, but I know that we've, you've got other things to do as well today. But, um, if you saw the future in some way, uh, improving, growing, learning, surviving, and the future for uh, for our for my grandchildren, who you know only too well, but for every you know the seven generations to come, how would you see? What could we do differently that we could learn from? From certainly from the years that you and I have been around, right? Well, up you know, I day. was talking to a, a friend who's extreme anti-vaxxer and now anti-government as well in Cal in Colorado mm. and he was just railing at you know all the bad and everything and I'm like he says I'm never gonna vote and I said well what, what are you going to do you know to change things and I think it comes down to individual effort like right now I'm supporting a family of 10 Afghans right I put them in a safe house in Afghanistan I finally got them visas and paid for them to fly to Pakistan for me, I feel like that's like very personal work that I'm doing. And there's a family of four little girls. Those four little girls are gonna be amazing women, right? I feel like the only thing that we can actually count on being able to do mm. is individualizing and localizing our efforts. Yeah, I think I'm the rest of it is- I'm family too. Yeah, I think that it's like too big to try to think about- Yes, it has to start with self. And what we can do in a small way in our own community, or even in the global community that can make some difference. A ripple, and that's why I focus on software that helps make that like personal connection because I yeah. feel like it's amplifiable if we can use technology as the amplifier, but not the effort. The effort has to be the individual effort. And that's really where I think yeah. most people are very frustrated and angry after COVID and you know, even more with the war and everything, I think the inflation, they're getting so angry. And it's really about, you can't really be angry if at the same time you're being compassionate and helping people, right? It doesn't you're, fit no, together. No, absolutely. Compassion is huge. So I just want to finish up. Now, I know you're younger than me, but um, equally, I've forgotten how much. Well, I'm not going to tell you how old. Well, <laughs> you're somewhere in your 60s. I know that. <laughs> and uh, and you told me that, uh, congratulations, you've literally just married your long-term partner, which is wonderful. But you are just, don't you feel, and, and I'm, I am, 74 I'm quite open about it and uh it's like amazing, we've still yeah, got amazing. so much to do so and to it do. is if you like our generation of wise women who have been you know there and back who are in a position to really support and help and use our knowledge and you you mentioned earlier about you know young men at, at tech conferences sort of looking the other way we have so much to give and and I hope that all women of all ages I, i'm working mentoring young 14 year olds here in my own little town at the moment is we can realize what we've got to give and how necessary it is for women to collectively come together in collaboration and create this compassionate future with men of well, course but i think the reason that i don't talk about my age is that um in technology the biggest taboo that I have ever come across in my entire life is age. I thought it was enough to be black and a woman, but I didn't have a clue as to how how ages the bad. society is. Yeah, yes, it's so it's bad. Terrible. And so I'm so I think that's something that we have to work on because we do have so much more to offer. We do have and to we're work so on. much healthier than other generations. It will be Absolutely. around a lot longer. So I don't know how to do it, but one of my big goals is to kind of prove to men, old, you know, old white men that an old black woman has like a lot to offer and probably even more i think i'm 10x whatever they have right yeah. i just don't know how well, to it's get all that about energy i mean you don't look like an old black woman you look like a beautiful woman ageless woman with huge amounts of energy you haven't got a line on you so i mean it's like you know we've still got so much to do you and i and it's been such a pleasure to have this time with you because we haven't spoken properly for a long time because you are 
constantly on the move and it's hard to keep up and you're busy so i, ran away. I, I have ran asked away you i hope next time you're in england you ran away i hope <laughs> next time you're in england you'll come and stay with me and in person meet some of the sea tribe and uh, create some magic with me here in somerset and meanwhile i, I feel very emotional right now because we really have been there and back together over the years so thank you thank you so much shelly taylor you are a shiro you're an amazing amazing woman human being I love you very much and I'm so grateful to have this time with you. God bless. Thank you so much. In this conversation, you would have heard Shelley talk about how she recreated a business and an income for herself after the untimely passing of Shaka and her business imploding too. So she took her passion of cooking and entertaining and became the nomad chef entertaining people at home for dinner and supper parties, creating an income for herself and doing something she enjoyed. What hobby or passion do you have that you enjoy so much you could see it becoming an income stream and a business for you too? Maybe not your main activity, but something you could really enjoy and would actually help you financially. Have a think, write it down, try it out. Thank you so much for listening. I do hope you try out this episode's seed exercise inspired by Shelley. If you like what you hear and want to learn more practical methods to help you plant the seeds in your own empowerment journey, then please subscribe to this podcast, rate it and review. Also, make sure you join our seed network if you haven't already. And together with thousands of like-minded women, you'll make friends, promote your business and share your stories. Visit seednetwork.com to find out more. Meantime, until then, I'll see you next time.